When the DS first launched in the mid-2000s, it was a bit of a surprise to see how successful it would become. With a massive number of units sold and an equally large library to match, I've always felt that the dual-screen developer system was really a sight to behold. It was one of the best-selling consoles ever, and it was reasonably cheap to make games for. Because of that, game developers came in droves, and loads of really cool creative titles showed up on the DS. Despite spending hours upon hours on my original DS Lite, its library is a bit of a blind spot for me, since there were just so many games to pick from. With so many really cool titles coming out at once, it was really easy to miss things. With that in mind, I want to introduce just one of those thousands of DS games. It's this little thing called Wizard of Oz Beyond the Yellow Brick Road. The game launched back in 2009, pretty deep into the life of the DS, and at first glance it might seem like a sort of throwaway game based on the Oz book series. But when you take a closer look, it's got a lot more than meets the eye. Oz DS is a turn-based RPG developed by MediaVision, best known for the Wild Arms series, as well as the modern Digimon games. I think most people would associate Wizard of Oz with the classic movie, and as far as I can tell, the story is roughly based on that. With the Warner Bros logo included in the game, I'm sure there was some sort of involvement. Beyond the Yellow Brick Road looks absolutely amazing for a DS game. The thing that surprised me was it only had a 68 on Metacritic and the good folks at Nintendo Power only left it with a 65. They mentioned that it's a pretty accessible RPG, but they also said that the game is pretty forgettable in the long run. But we did not forget. See, I'm always game for a game that sells me on good vibes and aesthetics. I felt like I had to check it out and see for myself. So today, I hope you'll join me as we take a look at Wizard of Oz on DS to see if it's just a pretty face or if there's more to it than those old reviews let on. When you start the game, you're introduced to a witch in some sort of spooky Halloween type town, somewhere in the land of Oz. She wants a name for the characters in her book, and that's used as an excuse for you to name the playable characters, Dorothy and Toto. And after that, the story begins. Beyond the Yellow Brick Road sets you off with an abridged version of the Oz story that we're all familiar with. Dorothy and her pet dog Toto are living somewhere out in the countryside. Her parents had recently passed, which is different than the original story, but she lives there comfortably alone. Of course, suddenly a storm appears, and the two of them are swept away and taken to the magical land of Oz. I don't think they specifically call it the land of Oz like they do in the story, but it's the same thing. You get the ruby slippers, or magical shoes, and are sent down the yellow brick road. While heading down the path, Dorothy runs into the Scarecrow, here referred to as a straw man, the Tin Woodman, shortened down to Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion, also shortened to just Lion. You can change all the characters' names like in other RPGs, but I didn't really feel the need to do so because they're such established characters. The first thing that stood out to me was actually the control scheme. Through the entire game, you'll be directing Dorothy with a digital trackball. I can't say I expected the entire game to be controlled exclusively with the touchscreen, but that's what's going on here. To be fair, the DS had loads of games that used all sorts of gimmicks like the microphone or even the sleep mode, so in a way it makes sense they went all in on the touchscreen. This sort of movement control might actually be harder to use than a normal D-pad, but it was fun to mess around with. Dorothy runs around like a race car, making wide turns and rolling up to high speeds as you head down the game's many paths. It's fun to control at times, ducking and dodging to skip enemy encounters, though it can make it really hard to slow down or make small adjustments. It really just feels different for the sake of being different. But it's not just for running around, the entire game is committed to that touchscreen. Your DS's buttons do not do anything. You can't use them in menus, you can't use them in combat, and you can't use them running around. Even Zelda on DS let you at least do something with them. This isn't ruining the game, but it's an interesting choice. After you've gathered the full group, they head off to meet the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, in the Emerald City at the end of the Yellow Brick Road. This is where the story really begins to deviate from what we're familiar with. 
The Wizard of Oz tells the four of them that by reaching his castle, they've proven themselves worthy of being warriors for his cause. There are four witches that each represent the seasons, and the winter witch Protea has conspired to take over Oz's role as ruler. If Oz were to leave the Emerald City, they could easily take over his place while he's gone, so he needs your help. While he doesn't really know what brought Dorothy to the land of Oz, he promises any wish as long as they can collect these 10 magical eggs and defeat Protea. Of course Dorothy just wants to go home, and so she and the others agree to the deal. And with all that set up, we're past the prologue and into the main game. I've only been in a few of the game's dozen levels or so, but it's safe to say this is one of the best looking games on the DS. Compare this to any other 3D game on the DS, and Wizard of Oz has gotta be at least in the top 10 or so. The thing that sold me on the game was the footage I saw of the yellow brick road, and the cover art and gameplay and character designs. The characters in particular really shine with lots of creative redesigns of the original Oz crew. I only saw the yellow brick road at first, but all of the other levels afterward are also rendered just as well. Though the game can struggle with the frame rate at times, the turn-based combat means that it's not all that bad. If you're curious, I'm recording this on a 3DS with a capture mod. Oz looks a lot better on an original DS due to the way the screen scales on 3DS, but I think the art style comes through. And yeah, I know that you can shrink the picture on a 3DS, but when I had it like that, it just was uncomfortable to play. I did try to adjust the capture a few times throughout the playthrough, so some clips might be better than others. I'm sure that it would run really well in emulation, but you might need a tablet or something to deal with that trackball. Either way, I hope the footage gets across how good this game can look on original hardware. This is a JRPG after all, so let's take a moment and look at the combat. I've already shown a bit of it here, but there are some neat little mechanics in this relatively simple combat system. After you get all four characters, you'll learn that they each have what they call a ratio. Each turn you have four ratio points to select who's gonna act. Dorothy and Strawman are one out of four, Line is two, and the Tin Man is three. So for example, in a turn you could use Dorothy four times, or the Tin Man and Scarecrow once each. It's basic fractions, and you have to always add up to four quarters. Along with the ratios, each of them are specialized in beating one of four enemy types. Dorothy beats ghosts, Tin Man can chop down plants, and the Lion can crack armor. Straw Man is good against sea creatures for some reason, but I'm honestly not sure why. These two mechanics work together to turn fights into miniature puzzles. Really, all turn-based RPGs are puzzles in a way, but I hope you get what I mean. The party members that are acting are the only ones that can take hits, so you can hide certain characters and put multiple out to spread out damage. It adds a layer of strategy to something that's pretty much just boiled down Dragon Quest. You have to organize your units in order to deal with each of the enemy types, but as time goes on, you'll realize that your party members have their own weaknesses to deal with. Even though Dorothy is the most balanced and good at dealing damage as well as taking care of allies, you can't leave her on her own. I realized pretty quickly that stacking four turns with Dorothy meant that she would just take four turns of damage at once. The straw man is fast, while doing the least damage, but eventually he learns a lot of debuffs that can help you in battle. Meanwhile, the Tin Man and Lion are slower and take more ratio points but they hit for higher numbers. Tin Man can only move once a turn no matter what because of his ratio, but he also makes up for it by doing so much damage. He was the best at fighting bosses and dealing with large crowds. But the lion, unfortunately, just didn't really find a niche for me in my team for most of the game. A lot of the time I would just use him as a third party member to take up damage from Dorothy and Strawman. He's not really strong at anything in particular, but he's also not bad at anything either. 
I didn't really mind the simplicity of the battle system, but there were some things that would get in your way sometimes. For example, there's an automatic system that will select moves for you when you select your ratio. It might seem useful for monotonous battles, but at times it would select an item for a move and waste it. In a random battle, I would be mindlessly tapping the fight button and then suddenly realize I just wasted my only revive. And on occasion, the straw man would get hyper fixated on using items instead of allowing Dorothy to use the healing spells that she has. Your characters also cure themselves after every battle, so using those items up is even more of a waste. And this would happen consistently throughout the entire time I played the game. I looked for an option to disable that sort of thing, but Yellow Brick Road actually has no options. You can't even change audio settings. Managing your health and item inventory is really important because Wizard of Oz DS is effectively a dungeon crawler. Every zone is a set of three sub areas, and your goal is to find a way to make it to the end without needing to reset and back out of the zone. There's an item to easily escape any level, but you need to be able to survive as you explore in order to continue. And so, health and resource management is really important. Occasionally, enemies will drop gold or items, but it's pretty inconsistent. The best way I found was to just manage my items well and use that money to buy equipment from Oz. And so you need to keep the money that you do have. If you take too much damage, you'll waste that money on potions and other junk, and that's something I'd like to avoid. Later on, the straw man learned the ability to steal items, which did make the game much easier. Eventually, you'll reach the end of the first zone and take on the Spring Witch. Being the first boss, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it turned out to be a pretty decent little challenge. Honestly, the entire game is a little harder than I expected. I found that the art style and theme and the controls led me to believe this is some sort of fun beginner-friendly romp through The Wizard of Oz. But that's not entirely the case. I'm not saying this is some tough-as-nails hardcore RPG, but it did make me think a little bit more during those bosses. She can buff herself and cast an ability that hits everyone at once, and it just made me think a bit more about using my abilities in smart ways, speeding up the Tin Man with the Straw Man in order to have him attack first. After the fight, you find out that the Spring Witch actually summoned Dorothy on accident. It was pretty funny to me that the Spring Witch just gives up and cries and then gives up being a witch altogether. And the rest of the witches are actually all like this. They all don't really care what Oz is doing and they're too busy being occupied with their hobbies or whatever else they're doing. They're really just chilling here minding their own business. After you've gotten all three Spring Eggs, you can move on to the Summer area. This pattern repeats itself for each zone, two main levels, a final castle, a boss, and then you move on. I found the best part was just seeing what new environment the game had in store. It felt like a good reward after clearing every stage, to just get a new themed area to run around in. You started in the yellow brick road, but soon you'll be in flowery castles, dense jungles, or autumnal forests. And it's all just so delightfully low poly and pixelated. The locations you explore are some of the most detailed I think I've ever seen on the DS, and they make clever use of layering sprites to add depth to each area. The beach level in the summer zone was particularly great. Think about how you'd expect a beach area to be rendered in a DS game. Maybe some simple palm trees and flat waves. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a few splashes around. And then you look at this. The ocean waves don't just roll up on the shore, but they splash along the rocks and the jungle segments of the beach are all really lush with tons of plants around the place. Compared to something like Mario 64 or Mario Kart DS, it's night and day. Well, to be fair, the games had to be more concerned with freeform movement or multiplayer. Beyond the Yellow Brick Road could really nail down the DS's graphical capabilities. It's really at a crossroads between the DS's graphical limitations and some really great, clever environmental design. The art direction and gameplay allowed the DS to be pushed to its limit here. The monster design is also really good, though most of them are your stereotypical JRPG monsters. Mushrooms, skeletons, wolves, that sort of thing. 
but the art style and DS polygon counts work hand in hand to take them into a very charming place. If you were to run the game through an emulator, I'm sure it would look nice and clean, but I actually kind of prefer that chunky DS PS1 look sometimes. They really went for a quality over quantity approach here, but that does bring me to the game's shortcomings. The production quality is so high, but it does fall short in the content department. For the monsters, by the time you're a third of the way through the game, you've almost seen all of them, and you just have to fight recolors. And those environments, no matter how wonderfully rendered they are, just don't have that depth to them that I wish they had in the gameplay department. Most areas boil down to a set of forks in the road, with different themes. Once in a while you'll get a little cave segment or a fountain to break up the path, but they're all really just narrow hallways. You'll find these spirits that work as puzzle mechanics to interact with breakable walls or switches to activate gates. But these spirits don't add really interesting gameplay and they feel like more of a means to an end. You use the fire spirit to light a torch, or use a water spirit to put out the torch. You use a wind spirit to lift this rock thing, or use the earth spirit to make it heavy. I have to say that the game's got really great production value on the outside, but the framework, the bones, they're just not that deep. The skills you obtain in the game are a good way to add depth to the combat, but the way you obtain them I found was a bit strange. You have to be taught skills from a father dragon, one of three old men that you'll find in the secret areas in each level. They challenge you in a sort of boss battle, and after you win, you earn a skill for each of your party members. Early on, Dorothy gets a healing spell, for example. The lion got the short end of the stick, learning how to escape a fight for free when you can already run from most fights. In the later parts of the game, you end up getting a drip feed of abilities because of the power spikes of each dragon. And then you'd have to wait another two or three dungeons until you're ready and strong enough to beat the next dragon. I really would have preferred maybe one skill per area, or when you claim an egg, you can buy a skill from Oz. At the end of the game, all these dragons really just felt like level checks. But the skills are also incredibly useful and feel pretty much mandatory if you want to beat the game at a reasonable level. If you skipped out on all the father dragons, you'd be stuck with the most basic combat ever and it would be infinitely harder to win. It just feels mandatory but with extra steps. Fun fact, you can fight the dragons after you've unlocked all of the spells. The only difference is that they'll fight you in their true form. I did not defeat the dragons in their true form. After battling and then having a party with the Summer Witch, Delphi, Dorothy and the gang head to the last stretch of Oz DS. At this point, things had been pretty easy going, but when I hit the autumn levels, it really felt like a roadblock. Some random encounters were really strong, and while I did make it through those three stages, by the time I got to the boss fight with the Fall Witch, I got swept. I did some grinding, unlocked some new skills, and I got by just fine. Earning those last few abilities really pushed the party in line. It felt like a lot of skills that you got in the middle of the game, were sort of bad and situational, but the last few here are really good. Dorothy gets a magic reflect which can apply a buff to someone so that they can prevent all spells from attacking them. Tin Man also gets a sort of rampage attack that hits all targets randomly, but with only one boss it makes it a great damage dealer. I really couldn't imagine beating the game without these last few abilities. It's revealed Flora the Spring Witch was using their magic at the same time that Holly the Fall Witch was writing her book. Holly's storybook happened to have a character named Dorothy and a dog named Toto, and so that worked with the tornado magic in a way that somehow brought them to the land that they're in now. It's really neat that the naming character mechanic was brought back as a part of the story with Holly from the start of the game. With the Fall Witch out of the way, that means we can finally head to the Winter Witch, Protea.
The Winter Zone, unlike all the others, is just one long final dungeon. You start outside, moving around through caves and that sort of thing, until you finally reach Protea's Ice Castle. The level design has gotten a lot more confusing as time's gone on, and the samey ice designs don't really help. After a solid hour of running around this maze, I made it to the Winter Witch, and once again, I got smoked. The pattern has repeated itself. I grinded up a few levels, went to the dragon to get the last few skills, and came back to fight again. The last four abilities you unlock are sort of like ultimate attacks. Dorothy can let out a huge energy attack at the cost of some health. Strawman gets a random attack that has a chance to do a ton of damage or nothing. And the lion gets a barrier for some reason. And last, the Tin Man gets another big attack to add to his arsenal of big attacks. Tin Man's ratio is 3 out of 4, meaning that he can only ever be paired with Dorothy or the Straw Man, and so his benefits would sometimes be outweighed by the value of having three party members out at once to take up damage. By the end of the game, my best strategy was to have Dorothy, the Straw Man, and the Lion so that damage could be divided between the three of them. For the first half of the game, the Lion wasn't as good and the Tin Man was better. But in the later parts of the game, the line would be really useful as a way to soak up damage and spread it out between the three party members. I really ended up just spending most of the time here grinding levels against these cats. I haven't really mentioned them much, but they serve all the witches in each area, and they're the only real NPCs that you can talk to in every zone. They usually don't have much to say, but they offer good XP when you fight them as enemies in the castle levels. After getting slapped around by the Winter Witch, it was finally over and I could claim the last egg and take it back to Oz. This is the only part where the plot really matters, so I guess this is a spoiler warning. Of course, as you might have guessed, it doesn't really go that well. Oz takes the magic eggs, powers himself up, and then kicks you out. He just laughs at everyone for thinking their wishes would ever be granted, and you end up turning right back around to Protea. It turns out Oz is a bit of a jerk, and the witches already kinda knew that. The gang teams up with Protea, who now runs the store and main hub area, and then you set out back on the yellow brick road to give that Oz guy a talking to. The Yellow Brick Road is extended now, and it's a lot longer than it was before, since it has to function as the final dungeon. It's a long segment that breaks off from the original tutorial area, with a cool track playing that sets you off on the last leg of the game. But man, this thing went a little long for me. Before this, you'd be doing two smaller segments between castles, but this is pretty much the third castle in a row. Plus, the whole time you're swiping up on that trackball, and I was just trying to get through the end of the game here. But after that long run down the yellow brick road, I'd finally reached the Emerald City, and I could take on the final boss, Oz the Mighty. The final boss took a lot from me, but it was a lot of fun. Thankfully, I didn't have to grind this time, but I just barely scraped by. The second phase was a bit disappointing because he just kind of goes red and then you do the fight again, but I think I was too busy trying to just not die at that point. For a game with such simple mechanics, I was completely invested in this final boss. I think I just happened to be the perfect level where my party had just enough damage and health to get by. I used all of my items, everyone was knocked out, and the Tin Man just barely clutched out for me with literally the last shot. With Oz defeated and reduced back to the man he was, the witches can finally return to the Emerald City, Everyone says goodbye, and the Spring and Fall Witch cast a spell and send Dorothy back home. But it seems like things have changed. 
Holly was able to change just one thing and brings Dorothy's family back in the countryside. And that's a wrap on The Wizard of Oz Beyond the Yellow Brick Road. You may end up in a tornado? Is that a threat? The DS really had so many games like this, but I really can't say if it's any better or worse than the average DS RPG, because like I said, it is a bit of a blind spot for me. It's really quaint and has some incredibly detailed environments, but it might not have the deepest gameplay to motivate you to continue exploring those environments. At the end of the day, I was, I think, in the right place for something like it. The weird power scaling with the way you learn skills gets in the way sometimes, and I honestly got pretty tired of those touch controls. But every once in a while, I would just stop and smell the roses, taking a look at those really beautiful environments. It was really impressive to see running on the old hardware. I don't know if a 68 is a fair score for this game, but honestly, those numbers are meaningless. If you think the game looks cool, you'll probably like it, even if it's just to look around the cool graphics and stuff. And who cares about an arbitrary score for a game that's like 15 years old, right? So have any of you played Beyond the Yellow Brick Road yourselves? I'd love to know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to subscribe and like the video. All that stuff really helps support the channel and gives more people an opportunity to find it themselves. If you want to see more stuff like this, I have a few more RPGs covered on my channel. Thanks again so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.